Good morning, everybody. Uh, this is Tommy Norris again of GreenPrisons.org. And we want to welcome you to what is now the, uh, I believe, the seventh seminar or webinar that we've done uh, on sustainability and corrections. Um, and I think this one probably will be, be one of the most informative and one of the most important since we started the series last year. Um, this one, I think, um, will uh, will bring more to the table in terms of, of specific strategies for for saving money, for generating revenue as you manage your waste stream more effectively, and it will also um, provide you some some real information about the value of um, a green cleaning. Um, strategies as well. So we've got two experts on in both those topics and uh, we'll be hearing from them shortly. Our next webinar will be in June and it'll be on effective water management. Uh, if you are interested in perhaps sharing some of your experiences at your institution on, on either uh, technology that you're using or use of rainwater, gray water, etc. Um, Particularly for, for those of you that, that are calling in from out west, we would love to, uh, to hear from you. So um, um, be sure and let us know. Our two presenters today on managing the waste stream and using um, uh, green chemicals effectively are Clayton Campbell of PABS Management. And um, Clayton is... is, is um, been with, with uh, PABS management for a while, and, and PABS may be in the concept of, of, of managing the, the waste stream and specifically getting more revenue out of your recycling dollar may be a little new to, to us in corrections, but it's certainly been around in the private sector for quite some time, and, and um, uh, Clayton's going to explain to us how, how you can capitalize and track and get better dollars out of the, uh, your current recycling efforts. Um, our other presenter is Bert Klein of Portion Pack Chemicals. And those of you who have been in, in the corrections business any time at all certainly know of Portion Pack and, and Bert and his folks. And Bert's going to, going to give us, um, some more insight into uh, exactly the the advantages of not only using green chemicals but uh, how it supports the mission of the institution the mission of accreditation and the whole uh, sanitation and cleaning process and why it's why it's uh, so important to have more than just have shiny floors so uh, I think um, I think Bert will have a lot to offer and, and we're looking forward to his contents uh, comments as well uh, as always uh, if uh, for those of you who've been with us uh, through the seven-part series, you know this is old stuff, but we'll we'll say it again for some of the new folks that are with us. Um, the way we will work this is the presenters will each make their presentation of about 15 to 20 minutes. If in the course of that presentation something strikes you, uh, there is a raise your hand icon that lets us know that you have a question or comment. It would be extremely helpful to me, because once again, I'm flying solo here, if you would type that question in the box on your dashboard there that you should be able to see uh, marked questions. And that will uh, uh, let me know not only by the raise your hand icon that you click, but the questions exactly what your, your question or comment is. In most instances, we will delay asking any of those questions or comments until both presenters have finished. And then, particularly since two or three of you may, may have the same question or comment about a particular topic, I'll try and consolidate those for the sake of time, present it to um, uh, our speakers, and let them respond to that. Uh, on some instances, it may make more sense to activate your microphone um, and let you ask the question directly. And, and again, we're going to be looking at time and the most effective way to do that and my rather limited technolo technological dexterity. So uh, between all that, we will do our best to get all your questions in. We expect that the webinar will not exceed uh, 
more than, than an hour. Typically, our formal presentations run about 45 minutes. Um, and um, um, but with questions and everything else, we should wind this up in about an hour. Um, would remind you that this webinar, as all the previous webinars, are archived on greenprisons.org. Um, this one should be up by this weekend. If you miss it, if there's some stuff that you would particularly like to go back and look at again, or if there's somebody in your facility or agency that wasn't able to be with us this morning, but you think it would be important for them to hear what these people have to say, encourage them to go to Green Prisons and go to the webinar links um, under um, um, the, uh, the the Green Prisons banner. Um, we're going to go ahead and, and jump right into it now and introduce you to Clayton Campbell of PABS Management. And uh, Clayton's going to uh, share with us uh, some new uh, ideas about uh, recycling and why it's important and how you can make money at it and how you can also generate some reports, which are becoming an ever more important part of, of what we do as it relates to the environmental side. So Clayton, if you're ready to go, we'll go ahead and get started. Thank you, Tommy. Uh, again, my name is Clayton Campbell, and I'm uh, a corporate consultant with PAVS Management. And I'm just going to talk to you today something I'm passionate about. And you'll see this uh, on top of the screen, opportunity and sustainability. Uh, it, today we have an opportunity, you know, where traditionally the traditional thinking is that, that uh, there is no financial gain in recycling. In fact, that it costs money to put up, you know, recycling bins and dumpsters. And, and, um, but that cannot be further from the case. What uh, we focus on, what we help companies do, is realize that there, you know, there is a correlation between environmental sustainability and financial gain. You know, <clears throat> and so how do we how do how do we go about doing that? What is our b business model uh, to not only you know realize and capitalize on this opportunity, but also sustain it? You know, our our business model for true sustainability, you know, has really uh, five key factors. You know, one of the first one is realize cost savings for our partners. You know, looking at the key factors that influence your waste cost, and how can we take those factors, and you know, partner with you in maybe you know diverting these, uh, or you know, recycling some of these costs, or looking at, you know, are you are you getting the most bang for your buck with um, with your dumpsters or with your, your volume of trash that you have? So how how do we look at realizing cost savings in your current what you're currently doing? You know, with your equipment in, in those areas is the first key focus. The second key focus is, okay, we have trash. Everybody has trash, you know, but how do we realize the money in that trash? You know, it, everyone's like, well, the traditional thing is, well, um, I'm not going to go into my dumpster and, uh, and, and pull out these items to, uh, you know, and turn, them into, uh, and turn them into cash, but there is a monetary value in these products. So how do how do we go about realizing that? You know, if I were to throw a couple a uh, couple of dollars in your trash can, you may be more inclined to go out uh, to go in there and find them. But um, we partner with other companies to you know help you realize the value of this cash. You you hear this term you know more and more frequent these days. Number three, reducing our carbon footprint. You know what does that mean? You know how do how do we measure that and track that? And that's kind of where we you know specialize in is environmental reporting. And you know, learning our clients' business and figuring out what is important to them to track, what environmental factors are they looking at, um, and we we produce environmental reports, you know, uh, for our partners and and help them track that. That's not the core of their business. You know, the core of their business is is something else. You know, in this case, it's you know focusing on prisons, but we help you do that part to track the environmental reporting. You know, also establishing key performance indicators is 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 a vital part of what we do. You know, how can we measure our progress if we don't, you know, have some kind of indicator to track? What are we looking, you know, to achieve? You know, without that, um, without having key performance indicators, we don't know where we're going. We don't know where we came from. So that's kind of um, what our business model. Going on to the next slide. As I talked about, you know, as finding, realizing cost savings, well, how do we do that? There's certain key factors in, price, in, in pricing everything that we have to focus on in order to, uh, in order to realize cost savings. So how much trash are you generating? 
you know, how often are you, are you be, is your trash being picked up? You know, uh, what is the what is in your trash? What is the contents of it? You know, is it all wet waste? Is it plastics? Do you have a lot of cardboard. You know, what can we pull out of there to generate cost savings? Your fuel and environmental fees. You know, if there's certain things that we can, uh, you know, if, if we can reduce the number of hauls, maybe your dumpsters are leaving empty, and uh, they're not full. You know, they're not at you know nine tons or you know recommended guidelines. You're hauling air, so you know there's fuel and environmental fees that you can be saving on. You know, are you using the right size containers? And you know, what is your cost per yard when you're are you when you're uh, when you're at the landfill? So what are you what are you being charged per ton? Is that is that equivalent to you know the market standard? Looking at disposal methods, are we sending you know are we sending our product to a landfill, or can we capture that cardboard that that you know the plastics and everything else? Or can we and can we send it to a MRF? When a MRF stands for a material recovery facility, that's basically a recycling center. Um, can we send it to a MRF where we don't have to pay those dumping fees uh, at, that we would at the landfill? Are monitoring systems an option? You know, you can put monitors on your dumpsters and tell to tell the company, "Hey, it's full. Come pick it up." You know, that's something we also uh, look at. Does that make sense um, for your business, for your industry? Looking at lease versus owned equipment, we've looked at um, you know big mom, and, uh, big Fortune 500 companies, mom and pop stores, and then some people are like, "Well, I want to own my own equipment, but I'm paying uh, you know outrageous amount to keep it maintained." You know, if you throw wet waste in your Equipment it's not going to last as long. So what is your you know what is your what does your waste stream look like and and um, does it make sense to lease or own your equipment? These are just key factors that we look at you know in developing savings for our, our clients. The next so here's a, a real life example of prisons. We did a, an, an analysis recently for Geo Prisons and we looked at five of their correctional facilities. And so as you can see across the top, those key factors I was talking about on the page before equipment. What what type of equipment? What is the frequency that's pick, picked up? What is your monthly rate? What are your current fuel and ta fuel and charges and taxes? Are you being assessed the environmental fees? So what we did is we looked at their current monthly totals, and by now uh, analyzing and doing analysis on uh, those key factors, you know you can see here we changed their frequencies. You know we changed some of their monthly rates, um, some of their fuel and, and fuel and taxes, and so. On a lot of these prisons, you know, on these five prisons, we're saving them uh, eight thousand dollars per month. So, if you look at that over a year term down the bottom, um, for these five prisons for Geo, we're saving them a hundred thousand dollars on five prisons. That's what we're realizing. We've done some other prisons as well. Is we're averaging, you know, some are less, some are more, as you'll see here. We're averaging about twenty thousand dollars savings per year in just phase one, just looking at those savings factors. Without what I'm going to talk about next is, you know, without looking at increasing the monetary value of that product. So this is just phase one. We're saving them twenty thousand dollars a year per prison. Uh, can you go on to the next slide? <clears throat> okay. So now we talked about here's an additional way for cost savings opportunities. You know, uh, in block in our Blackwater River Correctional Facility, uh, we looked at putting in a food digester. I know a lot of people are looking at this and saying. Wow, forty-eight thousand dollars! I don't have the capital for forty-eight thousand dollars. You know, but we've worked with companies uh, through their savings because we because we can project a savings of almost two thousand dollars a month um, for them by putting in a food digester. That's something that we can work with them on offsetting the cost. So we found on this there was a return on investment in twenty-five months. After that, uh, you know, Blackwater River Correctional Facility was going to start you know realizing those savings after they after they. Uh, paid off the food digester, but that was something that we helped them assist them with on the upfront cost. Um, <clears throat> so, what are the what are the benefits? Obviously, there's a lot of environmental benefits. You're not hauling as much to the landfill. You, know, you have less pollution, um, all sorts of stuff with a food digester. <clears throat> uh, but but basically, the economic benefits to it and how we are able to you know help assist. With that upfront economic or up that upfront capital purchase, is looking at you know we're reducing the number of hauls, we're reducing two to three you know hauls a month. We're, you're reducing 15 tons of landfill uh, uh, tipping fees. So those are the ways we're able to eliminate some of those costs by providing savings back to the customer on their trash, and it helps pay for the pay for a food digester. 
Um, that's just briefly, you know, another way that we look at uh, save cost savings opportunities. Next slide, please. Now, how do we go phase two? How do we look at increasing the monetary value of your recycled items? Like I said, there's trash in that, ca and you know, there's there's cash in your trash. So how do we go about, you know, looking at those items? Here are your valuable waste commodities: your yellow cooking oil, your grease trap liquids, you know, OCC, which is cardboard. Uh, your mixed white office paper, your plastics, motor oil, scrap metal, you know, if you have some standardized pallets, wood pallets, and also used tires. <clears throat> so what are the factors influencing, you know, the monetary value of these products? You know, can we divert them from the landfill? Is, is there a way that we can capture these products? You know, also, you know, what material recovery facilities are we, are we teaming with? You know, are we teaming with ones that are going to give us the maximum profit for these? You know, our, our biggest thing, you know, in this next item is market index. We track the market indexes. So if the product, if the price of yellow cooking oil, for example, goes up on the Jacobson's report, then, uh, then we help your contract and your pricing mirror that so that you're getting paid, you know, premium for yellow cooking oil or for your cardboard. It's the same thing. You know, the OBM yellow sheet is, uh, tracks the prices of cardboard, you know, in the, in the, throughout the whole country in different commodities. You know, volume and pricing. Do you have enough product to where you know getting a baler uh, to bail your cardboard or bail your cans at, at the facility at the prison? We're doing this, in, you know, in Louisiana at some facilities where we're actually bailing the cardboard, bailing the product, and because we have a volume, we have a ton that they're taking up, and they can come pick up three tons when we have them ready. That we're getting a higher price for our for our product, you know, and also you know we believe in transparency, open book negotiations. You know, when we go and, and, and discuss rates with our with the, your service providers, you know, it's our goal is to, is to use your current service providers and have an open book with them, open discussion. You know, how much are you actually making off this product, off the cardboard? What is going on in your market? Um, talk to us, you know, talking to your service providers about those key things, and just really having that open book transparency to where we know what they're getting and what their their margins are. <laughs> and we know how to be better facilitate getting them the product they want from our customers. On to the next page, please. Tommy. There we go. All right, so here's, you know, here's an example of looking at that, you know, a baler that we, we put in. And, <clears throat> and so we have this upfront uh, purchase prices, upfront capital expenditure again. So how do we offset that? How do we, you know, how can we help you get this product and increase your, you know, your increase helping you your monetary value for your product and also help you go green because if we bail this product, we're recycling it because we're getting money for it. So looking at, you know, a baler, for instance, we're, we're realizing on this particular baler because of the amount of projected savings per monthly, that is what that is is that's money that's not being sent in tipping fees to the landfill. We're no longer taking this product to the landfill, so we're saving money by not taking it to the landfill. And then also we're getting money back. We're getting paid for that product, and that's the projected rebate monthly. Um, so our total savings, that's how we generated our total savings for this, uh, for, on, for this baler. And as you see below, that's an example of the OBM yellow sheet. So you can see that if you go down here, OCC, which is cardboard, is circled. You know, you can go and look in what region you're in in the United States and tell how much you're getting uh, paid per ton of cardboard. And so what we do is, you know, track this because this changes. This cha it's just like any other market. It's commodity market. So these indexes change on a regular basis. And so that's what we help assist do is to track that and make sure that you're getting uh, the most monetary value for your product. Uh, the next page. Another example of increasing monetary value, I know some prisons are getting away from, you know, cooking, uh, using uh, fryers and, and yellow cooking oil, but uh, these, these two facilities that we uh, did an analysis for we had yellow cooking oil. How can we go in and increase the, the value of that product? What is the, what, like I said, what does the Jacobson's index say? What does the Jacobson's report say? Um, which tracks is the market index for yellow cooking oil? So what we were able to do is increase <coughs> Excuse me. Increase the uh, you know gallon per rate that they were getting paid. 
and, and then therefore they're getting paid more per gallon, so they're generating uh, additional savings per month and per year. Also looking at grease traps, uh, grease traps, uh, I don't know, a lot of people know this, but uh, certain grease trap companies now are taking the grease trap liquids and um, you know turning them into methane gas, biofuel, um, and so there's different, there's different levels of biofuel, but they're making money off that product now. So as before they were just picking it up and disposing of it, now they're making money off of this product. How, how can we partner with you know, grease trap liquor companies uh, to make sure that we're getting our portion back? You know, our, our fees shouldn't be expense, as expensive um, to haul that product off if you're making money off of it. So that's what we try and you know, partner with grease trap companies that are recycling that product so that we can capture that uh, product and show it on our environmental reports. Also with both of these products, um, looking at the improprieties in these products, you know, there's a certain amount of improprieties in yellow cooking and on grease traps. Are we being deducted for those improprieties? You know, the bottom stuff, the, you know, the brown stuff, the bottom of the yellow cooking oil that nobody wants and they can't do anything with. You know, are, are we being deducted for those products, for, the, for those impurities? The next page. Here's, here's the lifeblood of what we, you know, believe in is, is reporting and KPIs. How can we help people, how can we help companies and, you know, employees and companies keep track of what they're doing for the environment and their environmental benefits? You know, this is just, is just a key fact that they don't have the time or the knowledge or the expertise to go out and report what they're doing and the impact they're having on the environment. Um, so what we do is we partner with companies and, and, by, and by what we've gone through before, you know, helping companies maximize, uh, maximize the value for their product and, and uh, it makes it more economical, feasible to, you know, to partner with trash companies and grease trap companies and, and, uh, and yellow cooking oil companies that are recycling this product. Well, guess what? We're all of a sudden uh, capturing this product, and now we know how much we're selling it. So we know how much we're selling. So then all of a sudden we can generate environmental reports off of that. And so our biggest thing is looking at, you know, just for an example, recycling one ton of paper, say 17 mature trees, 7,000 gallons of water, three cubic yards of landfill space, two barrels of oil, and 4,100 4, kilowatt hours of electricity. So that's that's key for us. You know, you can't you can't track performance unless you can measure it. And so uh, that's what we do is we help companies, and that's what we actually specialize in is setting what targets are good for you, and establishing those KPIs. And then you know, if we need to course correct if something is not going right, we know it because we we're actually tracking it. You know, and by looking at by looking at these indicators and your environmental reports, you can see pretty clearly it starts to become clear where you can improve on your performance, whether it's education to you know, employees or, or inmates or you know, where do we need, where is the ball being dropped um, along, along that. On to the next page. You know, this is, I know it's kind of hard to read, but this is just an example of an environmental report. So what are our key factors? We're looking at the top section is what are we diverting from the landfill as, as far as uh, what are we diverting away from the landfill into a MRF? You know, we're paying for that uh, that haul to the um, to the MRF, I mean to the landfill. But how can we capture product back um, and take it to a MRF? So what we track is you know the number of hauls by making your dumpsters more efficient um, and looking at what's in them. Can we reduce your number of hauls that way, saving you know saving fuel for the trucks, tires, the oil? So. <clears throat> Um, by tracking, or basically our tracking is all based off of what are we diverting from the land, what are we taking, what are we diverting to the MRF, what are we recovering, what are we recycling. And so by looking at our tonnages on what we're, we're moving and what is in our waste stream, then we can generate a report on what we're actually saving. And so here you can just see some of the materials that we look at if you have scrap metal, um, you know, if you have aluminum, wood, uh, we give you a report on, you know, the percentage of your waste that is those certain products, and then how much of it are we recycling, how much of it do we start off on a baseline recycling, how much are we recycling now. And then on the, if you go to the next page, this is, this is a report, the other one, you know, was our environmental report, this is our saved resources. 
by diverting stuff away from the landfill and recycling it, we're saving resources, we're saving key environmental resources. So, you know, to generate that paper, to generate that plastic, it, it, you know, it takes energy, it takes, you know, it takes water, it takes, you know, oil, it takes all sorts of things. And, you know, it, it causes air pollution to do, to do all those things. So here's the environmental resources we're actually saving because we're diverting that product. And it's based off the tonnages that we use and there's some conversion factors um, that we have developed um, for, uh, you know, each ton of cardboard saves, you know, like for instance, 17 trees. So we know if we're, uh, if we, if we had 206 tons of cardboard, you know, I mean, if we had a certain number of tons of cardboard, you could tell how many trees we saved or how much carbon monoxide we reduced or how much landfill space we, uh, we reduced. So these are just key factors that we use in our, in, in our recycling report. Um, that is the end of my presentation. Like I said, uh, our key focus is working with our, with our customers uh, to help them develop these you know, cost-saving tools and environmental report. And the beauty of it, the thing that is grace of it all, is I can sit here and tell you that our service is free of charge. If we cannot find savings for you, or we cannot, uh, if we cannot turn your trash into cash, then uh, then there's no upfront cost, there's no out-of-pocket cost. Um, our service is free, and uh, thank you very much. Clayton, thank you for for a very informative presentation. I'd make a couple of observations. Um, if uh, if you're in a position, if your agency is not in a position to to take revenue in from the sales of waste products, etc. Uh, one of the, the things you might look for is, is, is this something that could be a viable industry uh, activity and uh, not only create a new product line within industry, which is what several states have done. Uh, just to give you some real numbers in addition to what uh, uh, Clayton talked about uh, with the states that they've been working with, uh, for those of you that were at the um, uh, Sustainability Symposium last year and had the opportunity to tour the facility of Putnamville, Indiana, and I know we've got several folks from Indiana on with us today, um, but in and these are net figures for 2010 based on their recycling recovery efforts and salvage sales, they generated over $37,000 worth of income. Um, that's not chump change, folks. Uh, another example, uh, Western Kentucky Correctional Complex last year, working with a six-county consortium, uh, generated over $70,000 worth of net income for the, the uh, consortium. And that's just paper and glass and cardboard and those kinds of things. There truly is uh, a science uh, to this uh, uh, whole business of recycling, repurposing, um, we're learning a lot now about, um, uh, Clayton talked about MRFs, but the, the whole remanufacturing business and this, that, and the other thing, disassembly of electronics, etc. Um, there are, there are a number of opportunities that I think lend themselves, uh, both labor-wise and certainly financially to the correctional environment. And I would encourage you either through greenprisons.org or through a, a local resource that you've got to make sure that you're um, uh, getting the maximum uh, return on, on your uh, uh, recycling and, and other kinds of things. And if you're not getting paid um, for, for cooking oil, if you're not getting paid for motor oil in, in a jail setting, um, I know the folks at Lafayette County or Lafayette Parish, excuse me, in Louisiana, um, have done a number of inno innovative things. They were part of one of our webinars back in the fall. So um, right now, I don't see any questions for um, for Clayton. So we're going to move ahead to uh, taking a look at Ed Green Cleaning. Um, in the previous segment, we looked at something that was a relatively new industry in corrections. Uh, and now we're going to talk uh, about something that's, that's been around for a while and, and has uh, uh, some folks that have been actively involved in supporting the correctional mission uh, long before being green was cool. So with that, uh, I'm going to turn it over to Bert Klein of Portion Pack. Bert? Thank you, Tommy. Uh, I'd like to add uh, 
about a year and a half ago, we were doing some education with the uh, State uh, Department of Corrections Commissioner, and uh, we were talking about sustainability and, and what uh, could be done with sustainability. And, and we got to the part about composting. And he said, composting, that's sustainability? He goes, we were doing that 25 years ago when I was a warden. He said, we didn't call it sustainability. We called it being smart with money. And it's, it strikes me as I was listening to Clayton's presentation, that's what a lot of what we're talking about is how to, how to use money more effectively. And that's one of the, the major goals that, we, that pretty much everybody has these days. Uh, I'm, I'm president of Fortune Pack Chemical Corporation. We've been involved in corrections for over 30 years, and uh, it's uh, probably because uh, corrections found us and we found corrections, safer chemicals that couldn't be used as weapons and that could be controlled were, were something that a correctional facility, you all know, is needed. Um, the number one uh, problem is with the chemicals, I think, is safety. And so when you're talking about sustainability and green cleaning, safety's got to be one of your major concerns. Um, now, I know that everybody doesn't isn't uh, ACA accredited, but that's that. Those are the standards by which uh, the, the industry actually works on, and what you're trying to do. And there are sustainability standards uh, in ACA, but there's also safety standards and hazardous material standards. Uh, sanitation, and sanitation is is an interesting aspect because this is the place where you work every day. This is where the inmates live 24-7. You need a, a clean, safe environment for everybody to work, and that's, that's what we mean by the, the word sanitation. Um, uh, we don't have a single customer who's had a budget increase. I would say 99.99% .99 of our customers in the United States have had budget cuts. So everything that we're talking about has to save money. And it makes perfect sense, though, that you, you would save money by not using material and, and using materials uh, intelligently. Next, on, uh, in terms of the goals that you would, ha you would have, everybody has, um, for our business, one of our big expenses is medical costs, health insurance costs. When it comes to a correctional facility, there are additional challenges um, with, or actually not only challenges, but uh, a lot of cost that goes with uh, people being sick. Now, just to, from the terms of, uh, of an inmate getting sick in a small environment, it can spread quickly, and that, that has a high cost to, to the state and your budget in terms of the, the cost of health. But then there's the aspect of what, what if a CO gets, in, uh, gets sick? What if they're out? What, what sort of shuffling has to occur? What sort of overtime has to be paid in order to cover for that sick CO? So illness prevention is for the inmates and for, for the officers, and it's important that we realize the, the impact that cleaning in a facility has on the big cost of health. Um, and the last one is sustainability, which we're, we're talking about. And so these are your goals, safety, accreditation, sanitation, uh, cost, uh, health, and sustainability. Those are your goals, but you've got challenges also as you go forward. And these challenges um, can go from small to big. Uh, population turnover in, in you know, a state prison that might be high security might not be a lot, but if you're in a jail, that turnover is huge. And one of the, the big issues when you have high turnover is people coming in and out of the facility and what that has an impact in terms of how you clean, but also the, the, any diseases that they bring in. So high turnover uh, population, you, it, it's even more important for you to have a cleaning system. The other aspect of, of that is that as you go forward, um, there, since the inmates do a lot of the cleaning, how do you actually get them to clean when they're coming in and out of the facility? They're brand new. Next is staff turnover. This, it's just the nature of, of the business that you have a percentage of the, the staff that are steady, that 
stay there, and then you have the other group that are consistently turning over. And then every, you know, if you if you stick around, you move up, and you are replacing people. So again, how do you how do you handle it having a cleaning system when you have the population turning over and the staff turning over? So often, it, it can be a, a great challenge. One thing that we don't have in work we sell through many different industries, 24 operate 24 hour that 24 seven mentality. That means that not only do you have staff and inmates, but you have that staff and you have three shifts on that staff. And that, those the difficulty with that 24 operation 24 hour operation is that you can have really good people. You can have a warehouse manager, a fire and safety officer, but they're there for one shift. And what happens when they're not there? And how do you actually address having cleaning 24-7? You're, you're in a facility. If you don't have good control, then chemicals can get throughout the facility, and that can cause problems also. And again, the number one challenge, I, if uh, pretty much if we were to take a survey today, the number one challenge would be the budget. So these are the, the main uh, challenges that you have specifically in corrections. And so what does it take when you go out to try to develop a cleaning, to have a sanitary program? What, what do you need? And what we try to explain to people is you need a solution that is a syst that's system oriented. Corrections is different than the rest of, of the, the world because you're in a secure environment and you have specific procedures. You have your own goals, and these are, you, you need to address those in order to be successful in corrections. It, you can't just have stuff because you're not going to get an, the, the intended result of sanitation, health, and safety without having some sort of system that can be used 24-7 by inmates and correctional officers. So what is a system? That's, that would be the, the, the big question. What makes a system? Starts with education. It's uh, historically in the cleaning industry, the way that people operate is here's a bucket, here's a mop, here's some chemical, go clean. But that's not good enough these days. We, over the last few years, we've had persistent, one after another, uh, outbreaks, whether it's the norovirus that, that has hit some correctional facilities, whether it's MRSA, which is ongoing, whether you have something, that you have these avian flus, the H1N1, the H5N1, the H3N2, whatever is the latest one. They keep coming back, and these are more and more difficult to address. And so you, you have to educate staff and inmates on what are the correct procedures in order to be successful cleaning. Standardized products and procedures. The reason we start with standardization is I don't think anybody runs a correctional facility and says that, that every correctional officer gets to do exactly what they want when it comes to security. And that, has to, that sort of uh, standardized procedure has to work in cleaning also. So how do you, you have to come up with a system where in pod A and pod B and pod J, they're all doing the same thing. Otherwise, when you move officers around, when you move them from one pod to the next, when you move them from one facility to the next, you don't have any sort of system unless everybody's doing the same exact procedures. So that's, that's, that's another aspect of the system that you need. Now, teaching people how to clean, it's got to be simple and easy. Um, I, I have some pictures here, just real simple. Uh, one way that we use to teach people in, in a the cleaning system is color coding. Our products are color coded, and it's, it's starting to become more uh, standard in the industry. But they've always been color coded because it makes it very easy. Like right up in front on the bottom there, you see a green bottle with a green solution right next to a, a green product. And if you look up on the chart, it's going to be the, the green part of the chart that's going to be in pictures that's going to teach what actually the staff should be doing. Um, we, that follows through in all of our materials, whether it's uh, online, whether it's a, a DVD, CD training, or the charts. 
that color coding just makes it a whole lot easier to train. And I say this all the time because my wife has actually done a good job of training me. It's spring, and she will say, honey, go get that green stuff and go clean the table outside. She doesn't know what the product name is. She doesn't know what it is, but she knows the green stuff is what she tells me to use outside. So it works because it's simple. And if you can teach a guy how to clean, then it's got to be simple, and uh, I'm evidence of that. The last piece of this is efficiency. There has to be a way in order to, to count what you're doing. Uh, Clayton was talking over and over about being able to measure. If you can measure it, you can reduce it. If you can count something, you can reduce it. This, this, is, this is what makes, this is the final piece to the system that puts it all together. And the fact that if you have the ability to count, you have the ability to track it. And if you have the ability to track it, you can see where it might be being misused or wasted. And this, this part is huge in a correctional facility, but it's really most important for anybody that wants to control their costs. So I, I took, a, we did a, just a, a graph for one of our customers that started, I think, in, in 06. And what we did, is, is this was a group of around 30 uh, facilities. And what we had is we implemented the, these prisons um, over a, a, a number of months, starting you know, with, with one facility and ending with all about 30 of them uh, w working together, and everybody on the program. And what happened, and uh, Tommy, if you can go to the next slide, you can see uh, from January where we were starting off until kind of the, the whole year, because you don't just turn this on in all those different big facilities. We're building, building, and this is a graph of basically their cost per inmate day, because that's the way, uh, a good way to measure the, the usage. So this was, as they were getting ramped up, as we were getting each facility on, you can see that the cost continued to go up, go up, go up, to where they were using our materials the way they used to use their old materials. Then the system kind of kicks in uh, after a year, and we start going and starts showing them and start teaching them and everybody starts understanding the system. And now that you have a system, now that you're counting it, you can, you can hold people accountable in terms of how they use it. So all of a sudden, the cost starts dropping. And it's not a straight line or anything. This is real life. So a year later, it had been cut in half or maybe a little bit more than a year. And it really dropped. And it dropped real far down. And then it kind of evened out over time. And what ends up happening is they, they ended up with a 60% reduction in their cost from their peak. This was all due to the fact that they could cut down on the, their cost by counting, by measuring. And it, it, once everybody had, had been educated and was working on the same system, it didn't matter if they transferred between facilities, didn't matter if the warden changed, the fire and safety officer changed, or all the inmates were swapped out, everybody was on the same system. And this, this customer is consistent around that, that area now, even today. I think it's gone drifted down a little bit, but it stays really consistent. So you have a system, and that saves you money, but accreditation requires a system also. The, the, the new sustainability standard, there is a uh, sustainability standard for ACA, and that's, uh, that's not a mandatory standard. And then there's the policy on how to run a, a correctional facility. And, and these things have, are occurring. They're not just occurring in ACA. They're not only occurring in every state. They're occurring because the, the smart use of resources saves money, and everybody is looking at how to save money these days. Now, green cleaning intersects with uh, ACA accreditation for hazard material handling. So in Appendix D, talking about if it's a zero or one, these are what you want to be to target because it is safety in a, in a facility. You need a housekeeping plan that is a system on how you're going to clean. You need tools to inspect. And you need the education. All of this is because this is what you need for accreditation. So the big question is, you've got a correctional facility. You want to do more in sustainability. You want to do more in green cleaning. We've been through all the, the goals and the challenges. You've got a system. 
you want a system, where do you start? Where do you, how do you begin? First thing to do in the beginning is choose green certified materials. There are, there are organizations, probably the most well-known one is Green Seal because they have an absolute standard. These are materials that are actually certified for a standard and you can rely on that certification. Self-certification by uh, companies is mostly gone in our industry, um, but you still want to get an independent third party like Green Seal that's certifying the materials to be safer for the environment, safer for people, and better for, for uh, in terms of sustainability. A big part of that is going to be the use of high concentrates. High concentrates is basically we take the water out and we don't ship water. Makes it plain and simple, right? Minimal packaging. This is one of the things that you see uh, places like Walmart are doing. They're, they're reducing the amount of packaging that comes into their, their stores so that they reduce the amount of packaging that goes out in the garbage. Now, that, that is just one thing that uh, companies do to lean their operations. But that, you have to think about that in your operation, too. Control the usage is maybe something that you can do in everything but in green cleaning especially, if you understand where it's being used, then you know where it's being misused, and you can attack those problems. And that actually usually points you to other issues, whether it's, whether it's the inmate or the staff. Control teaches you a lot. Control of your cleaning materials will teach you a lot about what's going on in the facility. And the last one that, that I'll be very clear on is partner for support. If all you're getting from your vendor is an invoice, you're not getting the full benefit of all that you can that's what, what's out there. If you get an invoice, you don't have a partner. A partner that is tailoring the program for you and helping you be successful is the best use of your money. You're going to spend 70, 80 cents on the dollar maybe for the cheapest material you can get, but for a little bit extra money, what you get is the support that will help you cut your costs. They're the ones that will help you be successful in accreditation. They're the ones that are going to help you have a clean facility so that you end up lowering your costs of health insurance and health care. They're the ones that are going to help you, you know, if, you, if you've got a vendor that's not helping you buy less, then you need a new vendor because these days that's one of the, that is what a vendor should be doing is helping you cut your, your budget by being smart with the way you purchase. These are, it's called a partnership for a good reason. So you can get an invoice or you can get support in an invoice. And the support is going to help you be successful in your facility. So I, I thank you very much. And uh, Tommy, I'll, I'll, I'll throw it back to you. Okay, Bert, thank, thanks a lot. Uh, as I look at it right now, we haven't had any questions from the field, which is probably testimony to the great job that both you guys did, but uh, I'll make a couple other observations and see if we get something in now. Um, but but in, in listening to, to Bert talk a little bit, I started in this business in 1971, and, and for whatever reason, one of the things that I remember, and I don't remember much from those, those initial 40 hours of training that I got, but I remember the sanitation officer coming up and talking to us about using a mop as a tool. Uh, and he spent about two hours showing us how to mop the floor and the fact that you just didn't take an old gray mop and shove, it, shove the dirty water around. And for whatever reason, that's, that stuck with me. So, so the notion of, of uh, encouraging uh, staff when they're working with inmates and giving staff, for that matter, the tools they need to help uh, encourage inmates to, to get involved in their own housekeeping and, and impact the way they, uh, uh, the, the sanitation levels of where they live is an important part. Remember, a lot of these folks have never mopped a floor in their life and never paid any attention to the, uh, to the sanitation in their own homes. Um, the other, the other thing that, that, that struck me was, was, uh, Bert's early comment about, about composting. Uh, and the, the fact that, that this particular system, and I know the one of which he speaks, um, had been involved in composting for 25 years. And I think that's something that, that we all need to look at, both as it relates to 
to recycling and composting and, and a variety of things. There's, there's stuff that we have been doing because it's what we do. Collection of cans, uh, composting, uh, whatever. Um, trying to maintain accountability of cleaners, uh, being involved in the accreditation process. Um, those are all things that we that we have done for decades, and in some cases, for those that are new to this business, maybe don't know why or where it came from. Um, but when you look at at evaluating where your system is in terms of of, of sustainability, whether you're seeking compliance with the standard, whether you're trying to document. Uh, your own role in, in environmental compliance pursuant to some sort of local or state ordinance, whatever, uh, take a look at, at what you're already doing. Uh, and in many cases, I think you'll find that, that you more than meet those, those standards. Let me see what we got here. I think we do have a question if you'll... Um, a little more about the uh, ACA standard on sustainability. Um, and I don't, I'm not smart enough to figure out how to say who that is. But uh, um, anyway, uh, the, the, the standard came out of the Clean and Green Committee at ACA and was actually published um, last, uh, or was approved by the Standards Committee last August. And basically all this standard uh, requires you to do is document that you are at least examining some area of sustainability. The whole purpose of this was to to encourage you to um, um, take a look at some of the topics like we've talked about today, like we've talked about in the past, and like we will be talking about in the future, to see if there's something that you can do uh, that will improve the operation of your facility. Um, and uh, so, for instance, if you've been using portion pack or some other kind of, of green chemical, and you, you can certainly document it with portion pack, but you can, you can I'm sure, get other vendors to do the same thing, uh, document uh, what you're using, why you're using it, etc to the exclusion of things that we really shouldn't have in our penitentiaries like um, uh, drain cleaner and bleach and all those other kinds of things. I did an audit one day and I watched an employee, not an inmate, but an employee put a five gallon bucket of bleach down in the middle of the kitchen floor and walk off and leave it and I just stood there and watched it for better than 20 minutes to see if anybody would come back and get it. Because we use them in our own households, we don't always think about their potential in the institution. And those folks, you know, Bert talked about the sustainability standard being a, a non-mandatory, and it certainly is. Um, but some of the things that you can do with, with cleaning uh, materials, if you're not careful with them, um, can cause you to lose a mandatory standard, as it was in the case of that particular institution. Uh, and basically, we had to come back and see them a second time. Uh, you don't want that to happen over something that's so easily preventable. Um, the other case, if you are already recycling, if you're composting, if you're um, compacting uh, cardboard, if you have an industry that's involved in the manufacture of um, uh, solar panels or some other kind of uh, lighting device or whatever, uh, all those kinds of things can help you demonstrate compliance with the standard. This one's really a gimme. Uh, it really is designed to help you be aware of the, um, uh, of the advantages of sustainable practices and products and, and encouraging you to take a look at them. I hope that answers your question. If I could add, I'm sorry, Tommy. Go ahead, sorry. Bert. If I could add just real quick. Sure. What we've seen out there, which is very interesting, is the impact of just starting to look at what you're doing. Two things occur. One, you find out that you're doing a lot of good things, and you meet the standard You just by documenting what you're already doing. The other part, which is that people, once you start looking at it, um, and it and it starts talking about your, your energy use, talking about the, the trash talks about 
um, composting. It talks about water usage. And all of a sudden, these opportunities just based to cut your budget fall in your lap because you're, you're just looking at it and getting educated on it. And it's pretty amazing because we've seen facilities uh, do things that, that don't cost a lot of money but yield a lot. And I, I, you know, maybe there's a, a chance, uh, but I know that the, the financing for some of these things is a challenge. But uh, like Clayton's uh, example earlier, you know, a 25-month you know, return on investment, that's two years. If you put it in the stock market, it would take you 10 or 12 years. You put it into uh, that tool, and all of a sudden you've paid for it in two years. I don't know. There aren't many investments that do uh, make that much money. And so I think there's a financing aspect of this, but uh, I think it's what everybody in corrections and every operation, but in corrections especially, is going to be pushed to be more efficient with their, their spending and look a little bit farther to the future. I, I think you're absolutely right, Bert, and I would take you back to one of the early webinars we did on performance contracting. Some of these items are big ticket items. If you're looking at, at uh, your HVAC or um, uh, replacing a lighting system or something something like that, um, the um, um, uh, but you can can frequently work with. A, uh, a vendor to help you finance these things through the savings that they ge guarantee you will generate through the uh, uh, through the, the the technology. So don't be afraid to ask. Don't be afraid to look for things. Uh, we're we're running really tight on time, so I'm gonna I'm gonna do a couple of things real quickly, um, and um, then we'll talk a little bit about. Um, um, the next time we're going to be on. Uh, I do want to again thank um, both Clayton and Bert, their uh, contact information if you have more questions for them will be on the website. You can you can reach out to them or um, grab their um, um, information here uh, on this slide. I encourage you to do that if you've got more questions. Um, would remind you about our national symposium on sustainability and corrections. This is the only conference of its kind in the country. It's the only event that focuses exclusively on sustainability and corrections. And and our philosophy is that it that sustainability ought to save or generate revenue for you. It ideally should create new employment opportunities for inmates, and certainly uh, it makes you a better neighbor by uh, helping you uh, uh, improve the environment in which you operate. Um, we've been very, very fortunate. Secretary Gary Maynard from the Maryland uh, Department of Public Safety, a three-time commissioner around the country, a past president of ACA, uh, and a leader in this field, uh, will be our keynote speaker for the symposium uh, on Tuesday. Uh, we're working on getting another uh, equally uh, renowned speaker for the uh, uh, Wednesday luncheon, and I hope to be able to share that with you by the time uh, we get together in June. Um, there are um, uh, basically once you get to the conference, most of, of your meals will be taken care of. We've tried our best to keep it as inexpensive as possible. And would also remind you that if you propose a workshop and the workshop is accepted uh, for the conference, um, your registration is free. So if you have uh, any interest in doing any of that, you can certainly check it out on the website or give me a call or an email to Tommy, T-O-M-M-Y, at greenprisons, one word, dot org. Uh, finally, the... Um, uh, for those of you that will be in Springfield at the uh, Warden's Conference next week, um, we encourage you to come by. We'll be doing a workshop with the folks from the Indiana Department of Corrections and some of the really neat stuff that they're doing up there. You don't want to miss out on that one if you're going to be in Springfield. Um, or come see us at ACA. We'll be working with NAS again uh, at ACA and give you a chance to meet some of the leaders in, in this business, including some of the folks that have been on these webinars in the past as presenters, including today. So be sure and look us up at one of those two events. We'll also be at Southern States, which conveniently for me is in Lexington this year. So 
uh, we encourage you to come by there. And finally, uh, if you're a vendor and you want to learn more about advertising, how to contribute to one of these webinars or a blog, be sure and give me a shout out. Um, our next webinar will be in June and it will be on water management as I mentioned at the onset. Uh, and, and we would love to hear from you and, and some of your accomplishments in your institution or, or agency regarding water conservation and the effective use thereof. Uh, with that, we run one minute over. Um, so we are gonna we're gonna call a halt for today. Thank you for joining us. We had uh, about nine states represented, um, which was down a little bit from what we've usually had, but a, a great turnout nonetheless. We appreciate your being involved and joining us, and uh, we hope to talk to you again, if not at one of the conferences in June. Thanks for being with us.